Hi everyone, I hope that you're all doing well. I'm going to be continuing my discussion of Ravensong, and I'll be focusing on the first chapter of the novel. I thought it would be helpful to give you a video lecture that focuses on this chapter because it's one of the hardest chapters of the novel as a whole. That's why your discussion is going to focus on chapter 2 through 5, and why I offered to give the first group the opportunity to meet with me on Monday and start their discussion on Tuesday instead of Monday, which is when the typical discussions are going to start. So for this presentation, I have collected different aspects of this chapter that I think are more difficult to understand or that can be easily overlooked. At the beginning of the novel, we are introduced to Raven, Cedar, and Cloud. Raven sings a deep wind song in the opening of the novel. Her song is described by Lee Markle as melancholy green. The color green is often associated with nature, growth, disease, and it's also associated with death, which I think is very interesting in relation to the character of Raven because she is one of the most significant characters within the text. Her whole purpose and plan within the novel is to bring the two communities together. She wants the Canadian town that lives separate from the villagers to teach the villagers how to cure the diseases such as smallpox, tuberculosis, and the flu that has been wiping out the Native Americans within the village. She also wants the Native Americans to teach the Canadians and in particular she wants them to be taught how to properly care for the earth. Raven's song is meant to represent the change that she is trying to bring and it's described as melancholy and the text even says that she weeps after singing it because as we're going to learn about Raven, she understands that change and rebirth require death. Now the character Cedar, she sings along with Raven and I believe the text says that she even matches her pitch. Cedar is a character that we're going to see in conversation with Raven throughout the novel. Cedar is very different from Raven, whereas Raven is the harbinger of change. Cedar is a more nurturing character. In Native American culture, Cedar is actually the tree that Native Americans in the West Coast part of Canada would actually use to build their home. So she's associated with motherhood and maternity. Now at the sound of Raven and Cedar singing, we have Cloud who comes rushing towards them and it brings the rain She's a very interesting character in the text. She's Stacy's younger sister. She's seven years old and she's very in tune with nature. In the opening of the novel, she's actually sitting beneath Cedar and listening to and feeling Raven's song. As Raven sings, Celia surrenders to the visions that Raven's song causes her to begin to see. And as her visions begin, the shoreline in front of her changes to a beach. And the modern houses around her vanish and are replaced by those of the past. A tall ship approaches the beach. The Native Americans come out of their homes to greet the colonists who are coming ashore. Fifty women board one of the small boats that takes them to the ship and they're able to interact with the men. But unfortunately, they become infected with disease and it is this disease that ravages the village's population 
that causes a cultural shift. And this cultural shift is also driven through colonization, which completely transforms Native American culture. And to just give an example of how that occurs, the Salish tribe that these characters are from and many other Native American tribes were matriarchies. But when the colonists came to the New World, they refused to do business with the women, and therefore it forced a cultural change where Native American culture was transformed into a patriarchy. So it switched from the mother being the figure of power to the father being the figure of power. Now the rain that Cloud brings to the shore is a metaphor for the tears of Mother Earth. And there's going to be several times that we're going to see the Earth cry throughout the novel. In this particular moment, the Earth is crying alongside Raven. We have a transition to Nora's funeral. Her funeral is attended by the whole village. The mourner's emotions are somewhere between relief and resignation. There's not a lot of sorrow for Nora, according to Stacy, but each villager actually came out to attend the funeral, and every one of them shovel a small amount of dirt into the grave, and the village men finish burying her casket. Nora is described as nosy and nagging. I think it's actually an interesting moment when Mary's daughter asks during the funeral if the woman who died was nosy Nora. And you have the people around them who are laughing and the young mother is actually quite embarrassed by the comment that her daughter made at the funeral. Nora is also described as cranky, cynical. She had a long but empty life. During her lifetime, she married, so she was a wife, but she was widowed very early, and she had to raise her children on her own. She decided to never remarry. She was very hardworking, tireless, and self-reliant. And she's also described as a fisherman because the way that she made sure that her children had something to eat is she would go fishing to catch their food. She actually takes it upon herself to both father and mother her children. She's the provider as well as the nurturer. I did pull out a quote that I thought was quite interesting in reference to Nora. Lee Markle writes, when people die, they lose their attitude. If it's a bad one, and they gain beauty if they were all right to begin with. And Raven comments within this chapter that death triggers change. And so the idea that Raven has is represented in Nora's funeral in that nosy Nora becomes someone who will be missed by the community, even though they're not actually mourning for her. They're more there because they feel the obligation to be there. Change is serious business, gut-riching, really. With humans, it is important to approach it with great intensity. Great storms alter Earth mature life, rid the world of the old, ushering and then the new. Humans call it catastrophe, just birth. Raven crowed. For Raven, change is about life continuing. The earth is being reshaped. People are maturing from children to young adults. Older people die and newborns are birthed. And so the new is ushered into the world. For Raven, death triggers birth. And therefore for her, they're one in the same. Now, Raven has plans for Stacy. She wants Stacy, because Stacy ventures between the world of White Town and lives within the village, she wants Stacy to be the person to create the change that she wants to see within both communities. Raven tells Cedar that Stacy will learn. If not her, then one of her children will be the one to bring about the change. These people are heading for the kind of disaster they may not survive. You, Cedar, should think before you speak. 
you'll be the first to perish. This is a reference to global warming because she's saying that the plants and the trees are going to die first and that the animals and the people are not going to survive. Raven also introduces the catastrophe that she plans to bring upon the people. Raven was convinced that this next catastrophe she planned to execute would finally wake the people up drive them into White Town to fix the mess over there. So the idea is that if the Native Americans get sick, they will go to White Town where they will learn how to cure the diseases that have been destroying their community, but they will also alter White Town to where they are being more manageable of resources and no longer overusing the resources and harming the earth. During the funeral, Celia stands in the corner of the graveyard. Her and the other children are trying to avoid participating in the funeral and acknowledging death, which is very interesting to think about because it also insinuates the idea that they somewhat understand death enough to want to stay away from anything related to it. Now, during the time that the funeral is going on, Celia is remembering Raven's song. She begins to feel numb and disjointed from reality. We have the sense that another vision is coming over her, and it's described as a web of knowing that she's too young to understand. In her vision, she sees men and women who are burying victims of prior epidemics. The men bury the bodies until there are no more men to do it, and then the women have to take their place. She sees her own grandmother as a child looking at the mass grave and grieving over her loved ones who have died. During Celia's vision, Raven sat peacefully on the fence not far from Celia, disappointed that this child had the courage to look while Stacy and the others refused to see. Raven is often frustrated with most of the human characters within the story, and particularly Stacy, because as I said in the previous slide, she has plans for Stacy and she wants Stacy to be the one to bring out the change that she needs to happen within the village and within White Town in order for the two communities to heal each other. We are pulled back into the mind of Stacy after glimpsing momentarily into Celia's mind. And Stacy at this point is comparing the village funeral to to the funeral she attended in White Town. In the village, she's looking around at what the people are wearing, and they are wearing decent black clothes, which is very different from what the people in White Town wear. She describes their mourning clothes as seductive. The men wear suits and patent leather shoes. The women wear fancy veils and high heels. She also thinks about her personal experience at her grandmother's funeral versus the funeral of her friend's grandmother. She says that Carol, her friend, simply cried, whereas Stacy had a much more emotionally intense reaction. And I'm going to read the quote just to give you a better idea of what Stacy felt during these moments. Stacy had grabbed grandma's coffin, sucked her fingers into it, clinging futilely to the box while her voice had come up from some place in her gut and let go a strange mix of terror, loss, and grief that seemed so old, so huge. So Stacy literally grabs her grandmother's coffin and clings to it, screaming because she cannot cope with the idea of a world without her grandmother. On the other hand, Carol simply cries because it's what is expected. Stacy compares the cars the Native American community ride to and from the funeral inn. The vehicles that the villagers own 
are called wagons and you can see what they look like. I have an image in the top left corner of what their wagons would have looked like. They carried what Stacy calls carless relations. And by this, she means they fit as many people in the car as they possibly could. On the other hand, the Canadians drive what Stacy describes as an actual car or a woody. And the reason that they are called woodies is because the way that the door frames were built was out of wood, while the rest of the car was pretty much made out of metal. And another difference is the fact that the the cars owned by the Canadians would only carry a single family unit. And what I mean by a family unit is the nuclear family, which is a father, mother, and their children. Other differences that Stacy notes are the fact that the villagers are comfortable with silence, whereas Stacy says that Canadians are not comfortable with silence. She says that they want to fill their world with noise, whether that be the noise of cars moving to and fro, people talking, music playing in the background. She says that Canadians constantly want background noise. She also compares their linguistic abilities. For example, Stacy is bilingual. She speaks the language of her tribe and she also speaks English. The people in White Town, the Canadians, originally when they immigrated to Canada spoke French, but they currently only speak English. So that's another difference between the two communities. The villagers have to learn to speak English in order to survive yet they keep their own language so that they are still connected with their culture. Whereas the immigrants who originally spoke French when they came to Canada have actually lost a piece of their culture and only speak English. The last comparison that Stacy makes in this particular moment is her comparison of the children. She describes Native American children as ill-disciplined and the Canadian children as quiet and obedient children who are basically seen and not heard, which was a common idea even in America during the 1950s, that children were meant to be seen and not heard. While all this is occurring, we still have Raven who is present and observing what is occurring. Raven sat on the fence enclosing the graveyard. She squawked. Stacy cast a look in her direction. She had the feeling that Raven was mocking her, bragging, telling her she wasn't clever, scolding her for something she had missed about what had happened at her grandmother's funeral. In this moment, Stacy is giving us information of how she sees Raven. She thinks that Raven is mocking her, bragging and telling her that she's not clever and scolding her for the way that she acted at her grandmother's funeral. We know as the readers that Raven is actually watching Stacy because she wants to use her to change the two cultures. As the villagers are taking turns speaking about Nora and her life, as well as the lineage that she comes from within the community, Celia begins to actually see what they are talking about. She sees visions of Nora's life, and she also sees her female ancestors. Ella, one of the speakers, draw Celia and Stacy's attention when she focuses her speech not specifically on Nora, but on the children who are present in the room. She says, look around you. Everyone did. See these children? The children all sit up straighter. Pay attention to them. Life is precious. Short. You are all visitors. These children are your guests. 
Do not grieve for those who have gone on. Turn your grief into kindness for the young. What Ella is asking the villagers to do is to focus on life, focus on their children. And although they are grieving for Nora's death, she asks them to transform their grief into kindness for their children, which I think is a very powerful message. Ironically, at the end of the chapter, we learn that Raven was laughing at Stacy's innocence, but she was also upset because she saw Stacy as lacking in something, but she didn't know what it was. To help you understand Raven's confusion, I'm going to read this passage. Raven's welling song was stilled by her own confusion. Raven could not power up the image she needed to end the drought, which seemed to plague the people. They had retreated for some time to the place of sacred thought. Their thinking sat at the edges of their life, rested on the periphery of every day, engrossed itself there, and became shallow. Their thoughts avoided death, lest struggle weary them. How to get the people to wake up was the dilemma that harassed Raven. If Raven could cut them loose from their obsessive focus on the now, deep thinking could be restored. And I emphasize this passage because it refers back to what I was saying earlier, that what Raven wants is for the villagers to learn from the Canadians and for them to teach them as well. She wants them to share their knowledge. And in order for that to happen, the natives have to go into White Town. And that's what the villagers do not want to do. I hope that you are all enjoying the book so far and that if you were confused by this chapter, that the points that I highlighted help you to have a better understanding. I know this first chapter is hard and it may make you nervous about the rest of the book, but I promise you once you get down these characters, you know who's who, it gets easier. Bye guys.